40 percent of Russians. So I guess about sort of 55, 60 million Russians every single day use Telegram. Telegram is like a kind of news app as well as a messaging app. And on Telegram, you can access anything you like, any information you like. And yet of the 30 most popular political channels, 24 are pro-war. So the issue isn't if only Russians knew the truth. The issue is that Russians, for different reasons, not because they're like inherently or innately bad people, but for many different complex reasons, do not want to hear that truth. They want to hear something else. And that's something that I think, you know, policymakers mm. need to battle with because this is not, and that's why I called this the the book sort of this the the first the first book, <laughs> Russia's War, because not because I'm saying all Russians are guilty. I don't believe that. I think you're guilty for what you do as an individual, but because this is not a case where you get rid of Putin and then everyone's like, yay, let's, you know, we can maybe we can join the European Union. It's, that's not going to happen. Hi, everyone. This is AJ Wardhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Today, I am really excited to have on Jade McGlynn for her new book, Memory Makers, The Politics of the Past in Putin's Russia. Jade McGlynn is a researcher in the War Studies Department at King's College London. She's the author of the book, Russia's War, and editor of two volumes on memory politics and history in Eastern Europe. She holds a PhD from the University of Oxford, and her research focuses on national identity, memory, media, and popular culture in Russia and Ukraine. She is a frequent contributor to international media, including the BBC, CNN, DW, Foreign Policy, The Times, The Telegraph, and The Spectator. Jade, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm really great, and this is a first for my podcast. So you're in Kiev right now. I am. And uh, yeah, and so you'll be the first person on the War Books podcast talking to me from an actual war zone, um, which uh, is is incredible. First, like, what are things like in Kiev? Like, what what are you seeing? How are things there? It's summer twenty twenty three right now. You know, what is what are things like there? People people are of course very defiant, but I was here um, at the end of April as well, and there was a real happiness then because they'd survived a really difficult winter, um, and spring was coming. Um, but I think right now there's a lot of people have been through a lot, to put it mildly. People aren't getting to sleep. You know, there are air sirens. I mean, most people don't go to the shelters. I mean, I go, but. It's normally me and some Americans, right, in the shelter. <laughs> but I think people are going through a lot, but absolutely sure. defiant. Now, the, the the main, well, maybe not the main threat, but what I hear in Kiev that is especially threatening are are drones. Is that is that correct? Yes and no. So there are a lot of drones. So for example, not last night, but the night before we had an attack of drones um, and um, they shot them all down. But actually a lot of people, a lot of Ukrainians or Kievans don't go to the shelter if it's drones mm. because, well, I don't know why they have their reasons, but, um, but when it's missiles, um, so we then later that later in the early hours of the morning around rush hour, um, had um, there was an attack of free um, cruise missiles, um, Calibri missiles. And um, for them, they even say on the messaging, do go to the shelter. And that time there were more Ukrainians because it's more dangerous, I guess. Sorry. Sure. Wow. Well, you know, doubly grateful that, that um, we're able to, to do this interview and that you're there on the ground, um, you know, seeing things and, and continuing your, your good work. So your your book Memory Makers very fascinating topic to me. Propaganda itself to me is just very interesting. I'm not exactly sure why maybe it's I think a lot of people are like that. Maybe it's just understanding how other people think. But there's so I used to when when Russia invaded Ukraine initially, I remember I, I used to flip on RT here in the US which has since been banned. I think in most English language countries, it's been it's been banned, actually. Just to like hear like what, because it 
at the time it you know it seemed like such a surprise but just to hear like what the russian line is and we've even here in washington dc there's a radio station called radio sputnik which yeah. i think might be around the world globally and it's still like a russian propaganda station but it's just it's it's so fascinating because i got the sense in your book too that while the the invasion seemed like a surprise at first you know if you think about how Russia has treated history and how they talk about history and how their propaganda works, you know, maybe it wasn't such a, a surprise um, that this invasion happened. So, so your book, right up my alley, would you mind just right first off here saying what, what is your, your book about for everybody listening? So Memory Makers looks at the last 10 years before the start of of, of the of the big war of the full scale invasion in 2022, and it looks at how the Kremlin tried to impose a certain vision of history, but also to make it something that was really part of people's everyday lives. And it looks at the way that actually society went along with it in lots of ways. And one of the reasons why they did is because it appealed. Because at its heart, there's a message about what it means to be Russian, which to be honest, after the fall of the Soviet Union was not, there was no clear answer to that question. And so after 2012 in particular, doing it for longer, but really intensive since 2012, it was a real effort to create this coherent narrative of why should Russia be? Is, you know, what makes Russia a nation? What makes them belong together? And a lot of that was focused around a very, around certain historical events, in particular, what they call the Great Patriotic War, um, so the Soviet fight against Nazism from 1941 to 1945 and the collapse of the Soviet Union and this playing on triumphs and traumas that people felt, you know, it was really effective and it was used to give people, I suppose, a, a sense of a sense of meaning and a sense of a unifying narrative. And for that reason, it's very powerful. So I guess the, the big question in your your book the big question is why aren't ordinary Russians more outraged by Putin's invasion of Ukraine? So I'll ask why. Partly for the reasons we've sort of been, we sort of started to discuss there because it fits within their understanding that they've had, you know, for eight years before the full scale invasion of what is happening in Ukraine. And it makes sense. So you started talking about propaganda and of course, it is propaganda. But I think often people talking about disinformation, they like to find sort of, you know, um, tr troll factories and they like to add up how many words about this bioweapon pigeon or this, you know, whatever they're called, militarized mosquitoes, I think is the latest one. But that doesn't really tell us a lot. That just tells us about one kind of drop in the ocean um, tale. What we need to look at much more is what's in popular culture and what are the core narratives because narratives aren't really about facts they're about making meaning and i think that's one of the areas where there's a real lack of understanding of um why russians justify why ordinary russians justify the war and that's because the stories that the kremlin tells and it's not just the kremlin you know also you know there are certain media actors that the media actors depend on advertising people want to watch this for a certain to a certain extent it fits it fits with what they want to hear and it plays on their feelings of humiliation from the collapse of the soviet union from when they couldn't feed their families when they lost status when they lost a whole ideological framework and way of seeing the world and you know the 90s were a difficult time for for russia and it also deals with that sense of triumph, that sense of, you know what, not only are Russians a nation, but they are really special because it was they who won the Great Patriotic War. And now, look, you have countries like Ukraine, or in their view, or the Baltic states or the West who are dismissing that or worse, trying to destroy the memory. And again, I mean, the war in Ukraine started in 2014 and the, how it was depicted was always as this is just like the Great Patriotic War. We, Russians, and who they saw as good Ukrainians who supported Russia, 
must defend the memory of the great patriotic war, which those fascists, i.e. Ukrainians who wanted to live in a democratic state, you know, with some accountability for for wild nepotism, they are actually just fascists who were backed by the West. They have no agency. The West has put Nazis in power. And for me, I mean, even when I speak to people, because of course, this is my second book, but in many ways, it's the prequel towards my first book to my first book, because I wrote Memory Makers first. And in Russia's war, I look at why Russians support or justify or go along with the war, the big full scale war. And in many ways, you you just can't really separate them because the, the two books to me, certainly, of course, I can't separate them. But the I speak to people who don't support the war as well, uh, Russians, and they will still say things like they were idiots for letting fascists and Nazis take power. It's really, really very powerful. And it gives you lots of, it's almost like a menu and you pick the bits that allow you to come to terms with bluntly the crimes, the awfulness, the horror that your country is committing or to dismiss it completely. Yeah, well, let's let's dive into some history behind, especially with Nazism, and then I want to kind of come back to how 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 Russians feel today. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously Nazism is in all of the the propaganda that the I I think that's fair to say in all of the propaganda or all of the first of all I don't I want to make sure I'm using the right term. Um, is it fair to say propaganda? Can, can we call it like the Russian I line? Think it's- yeah, I think it's propaganda. Okay. I think sometimes I avoid that word because it makes people think that then you don't have to take it seriously. That's certainly what I found before the full scale invasion. But ultimately, it is propaganda. You know, I normally say narratives just because otherwise people think, well, propaganda, nobody believes in it. It's just what's said. And that's not true. <laughs> Sad. Sure. That's an excellent point. Well, the Russian narrative. Mm-hmm is is often packed with references to nazism mm-hmm. um and you talked about like winning the great war but maybe if you could just like start start from there with how at the time the soviet union has has made history fit this this struggle against nazism and, and how that's being used today well i think in many ways it also comes back to how russia today generally remembers the Soviet Union, which is in a really de-ideologized way. It celebrates the Soviet Union, not Lenin. (laughs) Lenin's bad. It celebrates the rest of it because it sees Soviet Union as a great power, as as still containing that historic essence of Russia. And um, just like some some of the um, uh, some of the Tsars did as well during the imperial period. But first of all, the Great Patriotic War is not World War II. The Great Patriotic War is just focused on the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union um, in June. So 1941 to exactly. 1945. And that's important because then you don't have to deal with the molotov ribbentrop um, which is awkward to say the least for the narrative. Though they, they do address it sometimes, they find ways of justifying it. But this is a narrative where basically what you have when you strip it all back is the West invades Russia because often the Soviet Union is conflated with just Russia and Russia fights back and it has help, you know, from some of its, um, from some of the other national Soviet republics and those people are good, but it also has sort of nationalists who betray, who betray Russia. It doesn't talk about its own collaborators, just about other peoples. And within this, there's a real focus. So you said earlier about how prominent the Nazi narrative is, and it's true, but that is mainly in propaganda for the West. There, it is still there in domestic propaganda, but it often will call Ukrainians Banderovtsi, and this is a reference, well, Banderovtsi in Russian, sorry, Banderovtsi in Ukrainian. And this is a reference to a man um, called Stepan Bandera, who himself actually spent most of the Great Patriotic War in in Auschwitz, but was the leader of a of a nationalist um, of a particularly radical wing of the nationalists, who some of whose followers took part in the Holocaust and um, in massacres against Poles who who lived in Ukraine. And this has been a core element, not just since twenty fourteen, actually, but but you know much sooner to dismiss Ukrainian identity as something that is just reduced to you know these particularly extreme nationalists who lived during a bluntly very horrific time following the Holodomor, following World War II, 
on Ukraine, which was, you know, not like the World War II Britain or America experienced. And to reduce, you know, people who essentially really just want accountability or to, you know, take part in what they see as kind of European democratic values, to reduce them, to make it as if there's something wrong, there's something diseased with Ukrainian identity. It's just extremist and neo-nationalist. And the only legitimate Ukrainian identity is that of people who understand they're just Russians' little brothers and that they should be in unity and kind of subjugated, really, to, to Russian needs. And that's where this element is important. But a key part, a key role that's played here is so-called memory wars. So, for example, the the taking down of statues um, to sometimes to Russian writers, sometimes to people who were Soviet war heroes, but also had careers after the after 1945, um, you know, where maybe, for example, in Prague with Marshal Konyev, where they took him down, not because he was a Soviet war hero, but because of his involvement in the Prague Spring, which to me seems entirely legitimate. But that's not how it's, you know, reflected back in back in Russia. And there's this idea that Ukraine is trying to sort of destroy the memory of the Great Patriotic War. And that's just further proof. And it sort of makes sense when you come back to the de-ideologization of the Soviet Union, because really what you have is, if there's no essence where it's an anti-fascist struggle against Nazi Germany, really what Russia means when it says we need to restore the post-world order, we need to restore the primacy of the memory of, of World War II, is it means it wants to go back to a Yalta world order, the world order decided at Yalta, where essentially it controlled what happened in most of Eastern Europe. It had the right to sort of do what it wanted. So in a very weird roundabout, well, in a weird to Western audiences roundabout way, what you have is Nazis are simply people who do not like Russia. Nazis are people who do not want Russia to control Ukraine or the Baltic states or any other country because they are people who are challenging the World War II, you know, the post-World War II order that Russia won through the blood of its citizens liberating Europe. And actually, when you look at it that way, you can start to see, not that it's correct, it isn't, but you can start to see why it appeals to normal people. Because, you know, the memory of the Great Patriotic War, it touched an awful lot of people. I mean, proportionally more in, in Ukraine and Belarus, but still it touched an awful lot of Russians. And it's, still, it's very there. And as I was saying, and as I kind of detail in the book, the Kremlin has done a lot to make it in people's everyday life. So whether or not that's because your son goes to an after school camp where he recreates the battles, whether or not it's because your daughter goes to a summer camp where she learns how to conduct informa historical information campaigns to protect against those who would discredit the Russian narrative of World War II, whether or not it's the murals on the your sort of apartment block, all of these different ways, all of these different elements, they all contribute to making World War II, first of all, part of your everyday life, but also that sense that it's under attack. You know, your most sacred memory is under attack from the West, from Ukrainians who were supposed to be your brothers, you know, in their view. And it creates this sense of you are the victim and anything you are doing, you know, violently or aggressively that some other people may see it. Well, they're wrong because actually what you're doing is you are defending not only yourself, but what is right, because who disagrees with defeating Nazi Germany, right? You don't disagree. I don't disagree. So it's actually very clever and it works on that level. And I think people have been very dismissive of it because it's something that really resonates. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm on those lines. I'm curious about how during under during the Soviet Union, how Ukrainians were, were perceived by by Russians. Let's say in like 1950, if you were mm -hmm. to ask a normal Russian, what do you think of Ukraine? What would this person most likely say? Let's go for later after Stalin instead, like if we skip forward a few years, because then some interesting things happen that give us a bit more insight. But because they probably wouldn't have said anything in 1950, because it would be terrifying. <laughs> they would have sure, probably sure. reported you, right? Sure, yes. you Gathered around the dinner table in the privacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So after the, the death of Stalin, and of course, during Khrushchev gives this secret speech where essentially he denounces the... Um, the, the cult of personality around Stalin in, in, 1950, in 1956. 
But another part of that speech is he also sort of talks about the deportation of nations of different nationalities. And because this happened, for example, the Kalmyks, who are a sort of Buddhist nation, they originally came with the, the, the Mongols. A few Kalmyks collaborated with the Nazis during um, the, 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 the German occupation of, of their region. And so the entire nation, including heroes of the Soviet Union, um, were deported and their um, like autonomous republic or their republic rather was, was destroyed. And Khrushchev made a joke, he himself having many links, of course, and roots in Ukraine, um, that, you know, if we'd applied it equally, this rule would have had to deport half of Ukraine. And so there was always this sense that some Ukrainians, you know, had had betrayed the Soviet Union. But of course, it's problematic because what that forgets, because it forgets the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, is that half of Ukraine was only brought into the Soviet Union after 1939. So, of course, they they're not. I mean, I wouldn't use the word traitors about anybody anyway in this particular case, but they, they, they didn't, they weren't really even sort of Soviet citizens and they did tend to have more national consciousness. And, you know, whilst some of the more extreme Ukrainian nationalists certainly did participate in the Holocaust and certainly committed grave, grave crimes, that that's not representative of all of the Ukrainian nationalists. Many of them just fought against the Soviets. And I think after the Holodomor, in which between four to eight million Ukrainians died, I think it's reasonable to understand why they may have resisted that rule. But what you have immediately is this sense of, within Russian thinking, that there are two Ukraines. You have your bad Ukrainians who are nationalists, they speak Ukrainian, they maybe they wear vishivanki, like the sort of national uh, embroidered, the beautiful national embroidered shirts. They essentially embrace their Ukrainianness, And then you have good Ukrainians who are essentially little Russians. That's actually a word, Malarosyanya. And they understand, they speak Russian. Maybe they have a few, like, you know, funny words of dialect. Maybe they pronounce this letter a bit differently. But they understand that they're Russian and, and, and that's that. And this idea is, I mean, it always kind of existed, but it becomes quite embedded. And what you see is if we skip forward then, to 1991, this comes up again, and within sort of Soviet Ukrainian press, as the Soviet, as the Soviet Union is collapsing, this idea that Ukrainian, we like Ukraine, Ukrainians are our brothers, they're basically us. If they become sovereign, this is, if they become independent, this is just the victory of those mad Ukrainian nationalists. And you see it again in 2004, and you then, of course, see it again in 2014, and clearly we see it now. And so it's this idea that Ukraine has betrayed Russia. And historically as well, because there's, of course, the, as well, the Battle of Poltava, where Mazepa switches sides, who was the head of the sort of, he was the hetman, and he, um, of, of, the, of the sort of Cossacks, and he switched sides, stupidly for him, as it turned out, um, and supported King Charles of Sweden. And so this comes up a lot. And even now, I was just reading an article the other day, an RT in Russian, talking about Mazepa, and that you have Mazepa's Ukraine versus... I can't remember, but it was, you know, some other sort of Ukrainian who was deemed appropriate. So most Russians, if they talk about Ukrainians, certainly before 2022, even still, it was, you know, we, of course, we like Ukrainians, they're us, they're our family, you don't understand as a Westerner, you know, I have family here, you know, my granddad was from Ukraine, etc. But it's very complicated. In, in many ways, it reminds me as somebody who has Irish family, but it's clearly English, it reminds me of the interlinkages between Ireland and England, but most English people understand that Irish people are not English. At least now we do, anyway. It took a while. Well, let's 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 jump ahead a little bit to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And mm -hmm. I'm curious about how like the memory politics machine kind of gets gets going as it relates to Ukraine. So maybe you could just walk us through like for, uh, you know, for, since 1991, how have feelings from Russia, the Russian government, how have things changed and in, in how have they, they shaped history to fit a more, um, these are Nazis type of narrative? 
Well, I think as well, a key part, I'll walk you through it, but I think also another key part to bear in mind is that nostalgia for the Soviet Union, because they're very interlinked, um, and this idea of kind of restoring. So in 1991, what you have is Yeltsin really trying to kind of create a post-Soviet Russian identity, where there really isn't one, because, you know, Russia is, is quite, it's quite difficult to, Russia has rarely been a nation state, there's the sort of famous quote that, you know, Britain has an empire, or had been. Britain has an empire, Russia is an empire. And that sort of sums up sums it up. So it's it's it was quite difficult. And but Yeltsin tried to almost externalize the Soviet so that Russia did not, you know, Russia was not equated with the Soviet Union. And he failed um at that. He he failed um because people did still um, you know, relate to the Soviet Union, and in particular, you know, when it came to the, the Great Patriotic War. And so when Putin comes in, he almost immediately um, restores the Soviet national anthem that um, Yeltsin had got rid of, obviously with some new words, but essentially it's the same thing. And certainly from 2005 as well, he starts to really go quite heavy on the Victory Day parades, which are celebrated on 9th of May, but under Putin, actually to a certain extent under Yeltsin as well, but but less so, you know, become a really big thing. And, you know, George Bush is there, Tony Blair is there, which, you know, feels in insane to think of now you know uk but watching russian tanks on display but there they were and then and so it's already kind of getting started and then in 2008 under dmitry medvedev when he became president you know before before he drank so much as he does now perhaps um he um you know there was a there was a commission set up against the falsification of history and this is sparked by riots in Tallinn in 2007 by by russians um by by russian speakers in in, in estonia because they were upset that the monument was going to be there's a monument to this unknown soviet soldier which was not popular to put it mildly among estonians that they wanted the city authorities were moving to um, a local cemetery you know, so it wouldn't be in the center of the city, but would be, so it's not like they were going to destroy it or something. Um, and there were riots, there were cyber attacks, which is why now Estonia is like a crazy cyber powerhouse <laughs> within this. Um, yeah, it's really great at cyber security. I didn't, I didn't, I did yeah, not realize no. that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, so it's all there. And then when Putin comes back in in 2012, of course, he's very unnerved because there are a lot of protests against Force of, but bluntly falsified elections to the Duma, to the Russian parliament, but also falsified presidential elections. And so what we see then is he needs more legitimacy and the economic legitimacy that he previously had, because things were a lot better under him than they were in the 90s, that's running out because the economy isn't doing well. So it turns more to a sort of, well, I'm going to restore Russian great power. And of course, the pinnacle of this is Crimea. The annexation of Crimea. I was in Russia. I lived in Russia during this sort of whole period, and there were so many parties, just like Krim Nash, like Crimea's ours, Crimea's ours. Just three days of just absolute, just getting drunk, to be honest. And people, you, yeah. And there was also a real popular demand for the annexation of Don, of Donetsk and Luhansk as well um, at that time, but for different reasons, the Russian government decided it wasn't in their interests. Now, is this mostly? mostly staged or are poor no, people no, at the time generally no, it was completely including among people who let's say my friends who like sort of from the gay community who did not like putin but they were like historical justice has been restored crimea is russian it should be ours and this issue comes up as well in the 90s but it's sort of resolved in different ways but you know and bluntly i mean the people of crimea they did they did vote to be part of an independent ukraine so as well i think sometimes is, it's is there a real is there a real difference in ukraine between people who are in the west and people who are in the east it sounds no. like no not okay now. um certainly not now and i think the differences have been overstated anyway i think the problem is is people often think oh russian speakers versus ukrainian speakers and it's really the minute somebody brings that up, I know that they don't know anything about Ukraine. Because, for example, I'll just use an anecdote from yesterday. So I was at a barbecue with people who are ethnic Russians. Their first language is, you know, that they are they are Russian in, in that sense. And they all see themselves still as ethnic Russians, absolutely hate the Russian Federation. They have, you know, four, you know, some of them are of different ages, so there's different things that's sort of appropriate. But 
you know, they've been, some of them had been at the front line fighting. The idea that they would become part of the Russian Federation, it was completely just despicable to them. It was horrific. And the idea that Russian Federation, that people from Russia would come and try to enforce their way of life or that everybody speaks Russian on them. It was insane. And, you know, they'd spoken to many of their relatives back back in Russia and said, what on earth, you know, on the 24th of February, 25th of February, what, what are you doing? And they said, oh, well, don't worry, just wait a week. Sit there quietly, wait a week and you'll be liberated. It's like, liberated from who? I'm Russian. I speak Russian. I don't have any problem with that, you know. And these people often lived, you know, in the West, not far, far West, but let's say like, you know, like um, Rivne or Shitome, these sorts of areas. And, you know, it's like, well, who are you liberating from? Oh, the Nazis. Like, what Nazis are you talking about? Um, you know, then I'm a Nazi if because I want to live just in Ukraine, just to live my life. Who who are we? And that's the big thing. I mean, if if it was an issue of liberating Russian speakers, Kharkiv city is probably 99% Russian speaking. It's, you know, and... Well, they fought off the Russians. Yeah. Well, was it, so it sounds like then maybe, and perhaps this is because of memory politics, that everybody in the world was surprised about the invasion except for Russians. I mean, first, do you think that's a fair statement? And if that, no, if it's I not maybe that extreme, then why, you know, talk about some of the ways maybe that Russians might not have been surprised as opposed no. to Ukrainians. I think that Russians were surprised, definitely. I think they were in shock, to be honest. And there was not the elation that you saw in 2014 of like, yeah, we've got Crimea back. It was different. People were worried. But there also weren't that many. There were some very, very brave people. But, you know, the protest levels were not high compared to previous protests, let's say a year before, when we can kind of compare the rep repressive sort of measures, um, you know, that exist in Russia. But the issue is, is that it sort of made sense to people because it made sense of everything they've been learning sort of through this kind of these historical narratives that were used to kind of as an analogy, as the only way to understand the present, which was that Russia used to be great until the West destroyed it. It, it put Nazis in power in Ukraine as part of destroying Russia because, you know, Ukraine is part of Russia. It's rightfully that ours, Russian. And so Putin, he took Russia and he got Russia up off its knees. That's a very popular phrase. He got Russia up off its knees after the West humiliated it, started doing, you know, color revolutions, imposing its will on Russia's, you know, spheres of interest, Russia's, you know, innate natural allies. And now we are restoring justice, not restoring the full Soviet Union. Nobody wants Tajikistan, to put it bluntly but restoring that core of what they see as historic Russia. So basically the ideal, I guess, would be like um, a unified kind of federation between Russia, Belarus and Ukraine, or at least most of central and eastern Ukraine. And normally they argue that Lviv and those places, they can just go to Poland, which is good of them. So it's that idea of restoration because there's no vision for the future in Russia. So there's just a vision of restoring the past and certain elements of the past that were unfairly taken. And that's kind of the best it can get, which is why the historical narratives are so important, because it's about looking through the past, seeing where things went wrong and then almost fixing them. And it's actually a very popular book genre as well in Russia, which is called Papadnichestva. And these books are essentially about going back into the past and fixing some kind of historical moment, you know, whether or not it's going back into World War II and you, but you go back and you've got a super weapon and then you're able to like kill Hitler or you're able to stop all the losses of the Soviet Union. And it's, and I mean, they're really very popular and it's that sense that something went wrong and we need to kind of go back and fix it and we need to relive it and get back to where we should be, what's, what's rightfully ours. Do you think most Russians believe that... Do, do you think they drink their own Kool-Aid, I guess, if you want to call it that way? Do most people have a have a, a grounded in reality kind of understanding of of what's going on in Ukraine? Or do you think that the media is so controlled that, you know, if you repeat something enough times, then it becomes true in mind? Are most people, you think, in their living rooms, like, yeah, that's what they're saying on TV, but there's no way that that's true? Or do you think most people actually believe a lot of these these narratives? <laughs> 
I think people, I think, look, the question of belief or not belief is always difficult for an analyst. I think what's more important is that these narratives resonate. They make sense in a way that, for example, if I were to turn up in Moscow tomorrow or let's say somewhere else like Baronej or, you know, somewhere more regional and say, oh, you guys, you know, you've been doing all these terrible things in Ukraine. Have you not thought, like, wouldn't democracy be great? And, you know, like having a fairer form of capitalism, that would just be, it would be com- no, it would have no resonance with people's life experience, right? I mean, that would be a good thing to turn up and say in like Britain or somewhere. But I do want to make one point, which is that, yes, I think that many people do believe those core, those core narratives, not necessarily because they're mobilizing, but because it gives them an excuse or a justification. Because bluntly, if you did know or thought, let's say you just as a human being, somebody tells you, right, your country, where it's pretty difficult and scary, right, to protest or to kind of publicly go against, see, your country is committing heinous war crimes. And you hear that and you kind of feel that probably that's true, you know, in that sense, when you hear something, you don't want it to be true, but you know, it's true. At the same point, pretty much all of the media and everyone around you is either completely silent about the war crimes at best or saying it's a lie. You know, people are just trying to pin it on Russia like they always do. They've always hated us. At that at that point where you kind of need to decide which narrative path to take, it's pretty clear to understand why you would take, you know, the second one, because what are you going to do with that knowledge? the knowledge that your country is committing war crimes in Ukraine. Are you a hero? Are you going to go? And we've seen Russians who are. Most people aren't heroes, right? In any country. Most people, I mean, in Ukraine, actually, most people are heroes. But in most countries, people are not. You know, and okay, you could just sit with that knowledge. That's very difficult on a cognitive, psychological level to just sit there with that knowledge and go along with, you know, oh, yeah, let's, you know, send this and that to, to Russian soldiers in Ukraine. So there's that kind of pressure and also, you know, the kind of corrosive nature of of fear, which I think it it adds to. In terms of the control of the media, I just want to pick up on that quickly because yes, the television is very controlled. But as I referenced earlier, apart from one channel, Rasia Adin, which is state-owned, the channels rely on advertising revenue. When the propaganda stopped, when people stopped watching the propaganda around September, October last year, like the political discussion shows, they replaced it. They replaced it with TV series. And the propaganda, the amount of propaganda on the daily TV schedules also went down. People stopped watching. Why did people stop watching those shows? Because it was too much. They just got <laughs> bored of it. Yeah. And then another point to note is that 40% of Russians, so I guess about sort of 55, 60 million Russians every single day use Telegram. Telegram is like a kind of news app as well as a messaging app. And on Telegram, you can access anything you like any information you like. And yet of the 30 most popular political channels, 24 are pro-war. So the issue isn't if only Russians knew the truth. The issue is that Russians, for different reasons, not because they're like inherently or innately bad people, but for many different complex reasons, do not want to hear that truth. They want to hear something else. And that's something that I think, you know, policymakers mm-hmm. need to battle with because this is not, and that's why I called this the the book sort of this the the first the first book, Russia's War, because not because I'm saying all Russians are guilty. I don't believe that. I think you're guilty for what you do as an individual, but because this is not a case where you get rid of Putin and then everyone's like, yay, let's, you know, we can, maybe we can join the European Union. It's, that's not going to happen. Well, I'm curious about it specifically in schools right now. How is history being taught in schools right now? And how is that being used to, to further the war effort? I mean, schools is actually quite an interesting one where it goes against what you would think would be happening. So because in schools, they are bringing in more lessons. It's like um, everything about the most important. It's like this new lesson. It's not a great translation. So it's your dwarf. And um, there they explain why the so-called special military operation, as they call it, is happening, the historical reasons for it, et cetera, et cetera. There are also efforts to introduce a unified historical textbook, you know, just one textbook where you teach. However, they've been saying they're going to do that since 2008, and they haven't quite done that yet. And so what you have are several textbooks um, that are used within Russian schools. You can use kind of different ones. It's the same issue in the UK. I don't I don't know about the US uh, education system, but they're different ones. And look, none of them are kind of 
in any way like massively challenging the official narrative but they kind of agree with it and disagree with it in different ways so maybe they focus less on the gulag you know or maybe they focus a little bit more on it but so there is difference and it's interesting because there was a recent re there's a recent poll done maybe it was done just before the the war actually the the, the full scale invasion and it showed that russians very much support the government's sort of patriotic history line but they don't feel that it should be taught in schools or not as many feel that it should be taught in schools in that way they do feel there should be a bit more critical engagement with history because that's like an academic setting and broadly the government has kind of gone gone along with that like i say it does appear to be changing but the interesting thing is whilst that's true for schools it's kind of a little bit more nuanced picture when you look at extracurricular activities and many many russian children do extracurricular activities for example yunarmia young army where you have a million young russians and then it used to be for sort of slightly older ages and now it starts from i guess the equivalent of like first grade in the us they've now expanded it and that I mean the history they learn there i mean these are essentially fascistic organizations they are about mobilizing children about bringing them up you know on these kind of historical grievances and threats you also have military history clubs where children go and they wear the uniforms of the red army soldiers they bring all of this equipment out from museums and then they like you know make them go on marches like their forefathers went on marches and there are many many sort of extracurricular projects um including as well i mean there's a lot of films like blockbuster films about history because bluntly most people in most countries learn more about history from tv series and films and maybe kind of you know different elements like this than they do from their history textbook and i think the kremlin has understood that so it doesn't you know the history textbooks they're almost kind of not the the place to look because the, the, they give us a bit of information what's more interesting are the different kind of these sort of multimedia exhibitions about history these kind of like flash mobs about this or that you know these after school clubs that are really often quite fun you know people have like little uniforms their summer camps you know these are bonding memories for people that they're going to grow up and remember when they all recreated i don't know like you know the battle of wherever um and i think i think again like this sort of popular culture element it's really hard to measure right which is often why people don't want to talk about it but it's it's there it's been there since 2012 especially since 2014 there was a directive you know from putin at a meeting in 2012 to create living forms of patriotism when you're speaking to youth organizations like the heads of different youth organizations and then they've gone off and they've done it and these have been around for a while and you know i think it's going to be really hard to to dislodge because they're now pe part of people's childhood. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting that you, you bring that up. I interviewed a, an author a while ago and she wrote a book. Now I know it's like the Nazi comparisons, like those, you know, mm -hmm. Nazi Germany is a different time than, than where we're in now. And, and that's important to, to recognize. She wrote a book about her father who was forced to be a soldier in Hitler's army. Uh, he was in the Hitler youth. And her book, she talks about how her father, starting in grade school um, in the 1930s, there was, I, I forget the exact name of the organization. I don't think it was actually the Hitler Youth. It was yeah, like a, a precursor to that. Mm -hmm. But it was basically just like Boy Scouts, um, yeah. where you would go, you would build like campfires, you would go do out, outdoor adventure stuff, except it was also kind of tinged with, you know, leaders in these groups who are like, okay, now this is all possible because of like, because Hitler, the leader of our country has like made us all great and empowered us to, to, you know, live on the land and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm, as you're talking, I'm reminded of that conversation yeah. I had because the similarities are really striking. I agree. And I think it's that really it's okay. This is not like a sentence I say all the time, or maybe that people hear all the time, but I was speaking, I was speaking to Himmler's great niece um, wow. a couple of months ago. Yes, never heard that. No. And she was saying about how, because we were talking about sort of my book and and obviously, you know, the, there are similarities, um, but, you know, they sh it's not clearly, it's, it's a problematic analogy on many levels, but she was talking about how she finds it 
really fascinating because, of course, everybody wants to ask about her great uncle, but to her, the more, you know, Heinrich, obviously Heinrich Himmler, but to her, the person who's more interesting is her nan, who actually, you know, at home was, re- sorry, her great, her, sorry, her great aunt, because at home, she, she was quite a liberal person in terms of how she brought up her kids, you know, it was kind of like easygoing. She didn't ever really talk about all of these elements. And yet she was married to Heinrich Himmler. And it was just that element of like, what happens to ordinary people? And I think, you know, that's, we often like to almost like pathologize certain things. And the idea that if you don't make them kind of totally pathological, like what happened to the German people and what differently, but, you know, you know, maybe happened to Japanese people or what happened to, I mean, the kind of what happened, those processes and, and, and how they came to justify such, such horrors. Um, and similarly, what's happening to, to Russia? There's an attempt to be like, oh, well, that's there's something completely wrong with them, and they're not like human beings. But that's that's not you know that's not how we would act. That's not how you know this is something specific to their culture. You know, people try to find all these kind of historical determinism, which makes me laugh because it's quite similar to to Putin. You know, trying to find this historical essence. But of course, it's of. I mean, it's it's broadly nonsense, that approach, in the sense that, yes, there are clearly sociocultural kind of um, impacts, you know, that that certain histories and learned behaviours have. But broadly, I mean, when I was looking at memory, when I was writing Memory Makers, I'm sorry, but I saw, you know, many, many similar patterns, you know, in Britain, in the US, in pretty much in every single country. It was just the extremity. And that's not to dismiss the importance of something, you know, being of the extremity but you see a lot of these of these practices and things everywhere and i understand why people don't want to see themselves in in russians particularly right now but i kind of think we have to because i've always been not going to understand how they got there you know people say to me like oh how do people you know believe you know oh all of this like world war ii stuff do they believe it and i think let's say a britain says it to me and i think Okay, but quite a lot of Britons, you know, let's say during Brexit or leaving the European Union, reacted quite angrily when, let's say, Germans would criticise them because they would say things like, oh, well, my, you know, my grandfather never gave in to the Germans. And it's pretty obvious what they're referencing. They're obviously referencing World War Two, you know, or like, oh, well, we stood we stood alone in 1940. We can stand alone again and all of this. And and it resonated with people. It doesn't matter whether or not the history that that interpretation of history is a fair one. It doesn't matter whether or not it's appropriate to apply it as an analogy. I mean, maybe it does. But what's interesting to me is that it resonated with people and it kind of confirmed them in a certain political view. I'm I'm so glad actually you you brought that up because I I thought a lot um, reading your book. So I grew up uh, in a very conservative small town in America during the Iraq War invasion. Oh, okay. and <laughs> and again these are these are similarities. It's not the same situation, but just thinking about how when I was growing up, people were were normal people who are like, yeah, like I'm a patriot. So I, you know, I support our troops and, and I support, you know, them being over there and I want them to be protected, but it's a very kind of murky thing because does that mean that they believe in, in what we were doing? So I thought a lot about that actually when I was reading your book. I think it's really important because it's that sense of my country right or wrong that I think makes sense to a lot of people. And perhaps I think Americans, you know, maybe, things are changing now in terms of the political landscape, but Americans, you know, generally are quite patriotic. I think the idea of sort of my country, right or wrong, that's something that, that resonates there. And I mean, another one is in Russia is sort of, well, now we've started, we have to finish. It's a sense of, look, I wouldn't have started this war, but since we've started it, if we don't finish, if we don't win, then we'll have to pay reparations, you know, like we'll be seen as kind of, we'll be stigmatized, you know, it will be a nightmare. So you know, even from people who maybe didn't support the invasion at first, they kind of now are like, well, I'm Russian, I'm stuck with this country, <laughs> it's my country. And so what happens? But yeah, and, and also that sense of, I mean, I've spoken particularly with some more prominent analysts where you can see that they know that the invasion is just a total disaster for their country's national interests, for, for Russia's national interests. But they kind of, it's also a way of allowing yourself not to think through those hard questions, right? that are big questions of, okay, like, should my country be doing this? How could I be using my platform or, you know, my own kind of, my my individual responsibility to stop them doing this? Because you just say, 
do you know what? My country's at war. I'm a patriot. I support my country. You almost kind of allow yourself the right to to not ask those questions. But again, I mean, as as disastrous as, as and as wrong as I think the Iraq war was, I don't think that there is a comparison um, with, with, with what's happening now beyond, you know, some of the attitudes and some of the ways that people's mind minds work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a question I've, I've actually got for you that's uh, a little bit more recent uh, in the news with, with uh, Russia and Ukraine is the Prigozhin mutiny. Oh, yeah. And I was, I listened to the speech that, Vladimir Putin gave, I think he gave two, but the first one he gave. Mm-hmm. And we've been talking a lot about World War II, but I thought it was very curious that he actually invoked World War I. In yes, so 1917. Yes. And I'm curious, you know, as, as somebody who has, has written a book about politics of the past, you know, first, like, you know, what, I guess, what is the Russian view of World War I now? And like, how true is, is what, what Putin was saying, you know, Tell me a little bit about your thoughts on his reference in that speech. Sure. So World War One is very interesting, Russia, because generally it's been completely sort of forgotten because it comes, you know, like you have the revolutions in 1917 and then you have like this horrific civil war that lasts until sort of what, 1921, 1922. So it's, it's often kind of submerged just within all of that. And when Putin came to power, one of the first things he tried to do was almost to bring together like the 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 whites and and the reds, if you can call it that. So he went and he unified the Russian Orthodox Church abroad, set up by white emigres, so those who fought you know against the communists, and he unified it with the Russian Orthodox Church at home, and that was a real priority for him. And in 2012, he gave this this speech about how you know Russia is a country that needs you know a lot of cultural therapy, where the wounds of the civil war still loom large. So on one level, this is something that matters to him: this idea of kind of being the unifier of, of the divisions within Russia. But those references to the civil war, to you know, to to World War One as well, and to to 1917, they also come back to this point where Russia is essentially not its people; it's its state, and the state must be protected. You know, the people protect the state, right? Not the other way around. And that's an important kind of political lens, but also, and this is where this is more my interpretation, my kind of analysis of it based on reading a lot of these historical texts and speeches over the year, over the years. Um, the references to 1917, they were also designed to play on Russian fear of state collapse because Russians had in, you know, in the last century, Russian state collapsed three times. That's a lot of time. For a state to collapse and there's a real fear so it's like oh just at least don't let it be worse and that's a real like trump card that putin has because first of all i found it really weird he was saying these things because normally he says oh look you have stability with me so i was like why is he bringing up 1917 because i mean the wagner threat it wasn't as serious as like 1917 right or, or state or times of troubles you know when the poles invaded you know <laughs> in, in the sort of the 1600s but actually, the more I think about it, the more it really does make sense because he's invoking that fear in the same way that he invokes certain traumas like of the 1990s of the Soviet collapse as this is what happens if you don't support me, if you don't support the state. And that is a very powerful emotion because most people just don't want it to get worse. Most Russians. Uh, yeah. And well, I I wonder, you know, for... I actually read before before our interview um, a piece, uh, an interview you did with CNN talking about the the mutiny. I guess since it just happened, I'm I'm curious, like, how do you think things? You know, we we just talked about World War One, but post this mutiny, how 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 do you think memory politics are going to change in Russia? Um, do you think World War One is going to get invoked more often? Do you think that history might be looked at differently because now people are rising up against, well, if you want to call them people, some, I mean, they are people, but what I'm saying is like, <laughs> there's not like, you know, there's not some like a popular not movement. Sure, but yeah, 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 I know. It, it seems um, like there's not a popular movement rising up right now against Putin. There is the leader of a, a mercenary group, but how do you think things are going to change in Russia after this point? I'd be surprised if they change dramatically, because I think pretty much all of Putin's history, politics and use of history comes down to three things, which is 
the Russian state must be strong. Russia is a great power, you know, with this role like in the world, you know, to project its power. And Russia um, has a separate kind of civilizational path from that of the West. You know? um, so I think those core points, when you kind of boil them all down, will still be there. But I think we'll increasingly see much more focus on state collapse and on the threat of kind of historic state collapses and why Putin is such a great leader, because unlike Nicholas II or unlike Gorbachev or whoever, he won't allow that to happen. And we're already starting to see that narrative emerge, like on the Sunday like talk shows, for example, and the news discussion shows that you know, if if Putin had been there in, in 1917, then none of this would have happened. So again, that kind of that invocation of trauma to suggest that Putin is almost healing it. Um, I think we'll see is that, more. Is that generally, is that generally how, how television programs speak about Vladimir Putin as kind of the, like the, the fixer of all things? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. It's funny just because, it's slightly off topic, but it's just because I'm in Kiev and I used to travel between Moscow and Kiev quite a fair bit, often like via Minsk, right? Because you couldn't fly directly after 2014. And I remember like, I would obviously watch Russian TV in Russia, watch Ukrainian TV, you know, in, in Kiev. I remember coming back to Kiev from Moscow and I'd so used to how Russian TV spoke about the president, you know, in these kind of like, these tones, like he's an absolute Tsar and, you know, everything's like, Putin did this for the people people you know Putin has allowed this time thanks to Putin we got xyz you know all of this I came back to Kiev I passed TV there's some political satire it's Poroshenko as president and they had a picture of like Poroshenko's head on some kind of like mad dog and they were like completely satirizing him and I was really shocked you know I was like oh wow you can speak about your president in that way and I was like this is good this is amazing that's how you should be able to speak that says a lot about sure. you know not, not just your attitude towards power but also your attitude towards yourself like as a citizen sure. and, and yeah, to me, that kind of crystallized differences that I'd already noted, but, you know, really, yeah, it crystallized. Well, with, with Memory Makers, what are you hoping that readers take away um, after reading are, Memory Makers? Yeah. Um, I think there are a couple of points, one of which we kind of already touched upon, which is that, okay, maybe three points. So the first one we've already touched upon, which is that like Russia, this isn't something pathological about Russia. This is something that happens in all countries. And unfortunately, it's an increasing tendency towards this sort of historical narcissism. And we should look at Russia as an example of where it leads. If you start to mistake your identity with a certain view of history and restoring that kind of historical grievance, because it doesn't lead anywhere happy. Secondly, I would say that it matters. This is not just kind of some propaganda line, um, as many people used to try to convince me when I was doing my PhD on it. And I was like, no, you don't understand. Like this resonates, this works for people. And I think that that kind of sort of historic mindedness in the same way that we study kind of other people, other countries, sorry, doctrines. I think we need to study other countries' understandings of the past, particularly past wars and past events, you know, much more in order to understand how they view things because you know world war ii is not the great patriotic war the collapse of the soviet union is is not that in russia instead it's you know when america destroyed the soviet union and that's important you know in terms of how they then formulate their relations their view of the world and then thirdly i think and maybe this is a slightly more academic point so please forgive me but i think this argument that i make around cultural consciousness that sense that Russia has this unique access to historical truth because it's more in touch with its traditions, with its kind of innate values and and with its history. It pays more attention to its history, unlike the kind of godless West, which has been culturally colonized um, by. And this is I mean, I'm quoting their national security strategy from 2021. So this isn't some kind of niche media thing culturally colonized by America and is now trying to destroy Russian culture. Because I think that narrative, I think that narrative has, or that way of viewing the world, I think it has legs, to be honest with you. And I think it could be appealing beyond, well, I think it is appealing beyond just Russia. So again, I think not seeing this as Russia is the extreme example from which we should learn. And and I guess I suppose in an era of, of kind of identity politics, it's perhaps inevitable that that history would start to take on this kind of ideological role almost. Yeah. Well, Jade, this has been such a fantastic interview. 
I've I've learned so much. Uh, I hope everybody else learned so much. What are you What are you working on next? You seem to have a, a pretty prolific output <laughs> here. What's uh, What's around the corner for you in terms of your writing? I mean, I think it's just because I always kind of worked on this, and then everybody was like, "Why are you working on something so niche?" And then obviously in twenty twenty two, people are like, "Oh, okay, it's not niche." It's like, yeah, I did, it. <laughs> but um, but um, I mean, it's a tragedy. I think when when one's research becomes this relevant, unfortunately, but. Um, in terms of next, at the moment, I'm doing a six year research project on Russia's use of history and its foreign policy narratives towards, you know, countries in like Africa, certain countries in Europe. So not towards those countries who used to be part of the Soviet Union. And I'm also working on a book about. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to say. Oh, OK, <laughs> well, we can we sorry, can keep it as a, a first bit, yeah. <laughs> we'll keep sorry. it as a cliffhanger for um, uh, for for the audience. Um, well, if folks want to follow you, if they want to stay in touch with your work, uh, are you on social media? How can people stay in touch with what you're doing? Yeah, I have Twitter. It's at, if Twitter still exists by the time this comes out, it's at Dr. Jade McGlynn. So all, all one word. Wonderful. Well, Jade McGlynn, Memory Makers, The Politics of the Past in Putin's Russia. Go buy a copy. Go check it out from your library. What a, a fascinating book. And Jade, thank you so much. Thank you.